this afternoon to uh, moderate your first panel of the day. Uh, this panel is the International Leaders Panel, and uh, I think we've got a great uh, session set up for you here today. Uh, before I get started, I do want to right up front thank every one of these panel members for agreeing to participate in this uh, on behalf of General Crosby, uh, the President at Quad A, and uh, Major General McCurry, our branch chief. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an important topic, and uh, I hope to do it great justice today. Uh, I shouldn't have any problem with that with the distinguished gentleman here to the left uh, to talk here today. Uh, before I get into the introductions, uh, I would like to just cover a few uh, ground rules once we get into the Q&A session uh, today. So one, there'll be a microphone. Where's, where's my gentleman? Cole Hedden, thank you very much. Uh, he'll man the mic. Uh, when it's, you have a question you want to ask, please move to the mic. We're trying to keep it centered so we don't get into the interference with the speakers. With lessons learned from previous sessions. Uh, once you have the mic, don't talk out here. Uh, we won't hear you. Please don't be afraid of the mic. Bring it right up to your face and, and speak. Uh, speak clearly, unlike your moderator here today. Speak slowly. And please don't use slang terminology or acronyms, if you can at all avoid it. Uh, six of us up here, five of us are separated by a common language, English, and then we've got General Distasio who speaks great English, but let's not make him work hard, okay, or the rest of us. So let's keep it very, very clear when we're asking our questions, okay? And so, uh, the panel. Uh, to my left, starting with Mr. Patrick Mason. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Defense, Exports, and Cooperation. Uh, previously, I believe, in a former life, Deputy PEO Aviation, so steeped in acquisition, logistics, uh, and supporting our Army. So great to have you here, sir. Uh, next in the lineup, Major General Andre Distasio, Commander of the Italian Army Aviation. Next is Major General Stephen Jobson, Commander, Australian Army Aviation Command. Brigadier Mark Ackrell, Commander, 1st Aviation Brigade Combat Team in the UK. And finally, bringing up the, uh, the distinguished panel is Chris McKenna, Brigadier General Chris McKenna, Director General, Air and Space Force Development, Canadian Armed Forces. So I think you can tell just by titles, uh, and the fact they're just absolutely handsome. We have a great uh, panel set up for you today. Uh, so, what I'd like to do next is have each of them make short introductory remarks and we'll uh, get right into the session. Sir? All right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and be part of this esteemed panel. Uh, I know I look a little bit different. You've got operational commanders and then a bureaucrat, and so the question may be, why did they put the bureaucrat on the panel? But really, in my role and working for the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, the Honorable Bush, uh, we execute security cooperation, security assistance, and armaments cooperation for the Army and nested underneath uh, DOD, OSD, and our Defense Security Cooperation Agency. And so in that role, working very closely with our allies and partners, we look at all of the tools and methods that we can bring to bear to create the type of approaches that are of mutual benefit to us as we look at achieving our national defense strategy of integrated deterrence. And so I can add some discussion to the, the topics, not about necessarily the what, but about how we are going about the business of achieving interoperability, which is ultimately the goal. And so while folks will often look at me, look at our office and think foreign military sales, it's really about the array of things that we can do that ultimately achieve the interoperability that operational commanders need and that are aligned to the overall strategy, and then how we follow that up with all of the necessary processes and functions uh, that can lead to that, both in policy and statute that really create the effects and so with that, I look forward to the discussion, and I look forward to, uh, to listening to the panel members, because uh, I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from listening to them. So thank you. Thank you. General Stasio. Team, first of all, thank you for your attention. Uh, I am the only non-attentive uh, speaker, so I hope that my English is, uh, is clear. And uh, I want to say thank you to the 
uh, American Army Aviation Association to have given us, uh, to Italy and to me, uh, this opportunity to share with all of you uh, our ideas on interoperability on the future of uh, our uh, Army Aviation world. I say hello to my colleagues. Uh, I, I have met Steve for the first time, Mark and Chris, uh, Mark in London, and Chris uh, during the Edge 22. Sir, uh, thank you for uh, your presence. Uh, and uh, I want to say that uh, interoperability, interoperability for us uh, is, uh, is uh, crucial, is very, very important. But we must be ready, we must be trained uh, before the conflict in order to be ready to, to work, uh, to work uh, together. Our effort uh, is uh, a real strong uh, effort in order to achieve the same characteristic parameter of uh, US, uh, US Air Force, uh, uh, Army Aviation Forces that is uh, a reference for, uh, for, uh, for us. I am very proud to stay here on behalf of my chief of staff and uh, that's an honor, uh, an honor for, uh, for, uh, for me. Uh, so, Army is uh, always uh, in uh, first line during the operation, Army Aviation uh, much more. We are uh, very important uh, in supporting uh, uh, Army uh, on, on, uh, on the ground. So to dealing uh, with, uh, uh, with you concerning uh, the ground maneuver and the land maneuver of the third dimension uh, will be very interesting uh, for, uh, for uh, everyone. Uh, so Italy is uh, putting uh, a big attention uh, uh, to our process uh, to introduce uh, emerging uh, technology and uh, future uh, uh, helicopters. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. General Jobson. Uh, firstly, General Edens, thank you very much once again for the opportunity uh, to join uh, with you and the, this esteemed uh, panel uh, today. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, the Association uh, for Extending the Invitation to Australia. Um, so I am the commander of the Australian Army Aviation Command, and many of you may not know what that is. It's quite a new command. It was raised in December of 2021. So a short introduction uh, to the command. We previously uh, to uh, existing were um, dispersed uh, throughout the Australian Army. Uh, it, and it was decided uh, that to ensure that we had the command and control necessary to both pursue the modernisation uh, and the readiness that we needed to be uh, essentially uh, performing at optimal levels uh, to ensure that we're at our best uh, for interoperability, um, we formed uh, the command where we brought together our aviation brigade our Aviation Training Centre, our Capability Management uh, Directorates and our Operational Airworthiness Directorates. Uh, our mission uh, is to deliver aviation capability in order to generate land power to the joint force. And we perform five functions, airworthiness management, uh, capability management, uh, workforce and training management, generating forces and command and control through a modest uh, Chief of Staff Directorate. Our headquarters is based in Canberra, our brigade is disaggregated right across the country, and our training centre is based in South East Queensland. We currently operate uh, the ARH Tiger uh, attack reconnaissance helicopter, the MRH-90 uh, troop lift helicopter, CH-47 Foxtrot cargo helicopter, and we're in the process of transitioning uh, from uh, the Shadow, RQ-7 Shadow tactical uh, uncrewed aerial system to the uh, RQ-21 in situ integrator. We also lease uh, two AW-139 light utility helicopters uh, through our partner Toll, uh, and we've actually got a third uh, AW-139 coming on at the beginning of uh, next year. We don't have a Marine Corps in Australia, but we're an island nation and we have a considerable liability for amphibious operations. And so Australian Army Aviation is routinely deployed on our uh, 23,500 tonne landing helicopter dock uh, vessels. And we also uh, support our special operations 
forces. Uh, once again, I'm delighted to be here uh, today with all of you, and I also look forward to learning a great deal on today's panel. Thank you. Thank you. General Ockerell. Tim, thank you. Uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to see so many of you here. Thank you for coming along to, to listen to us and to hopefully challenge us as well. And I think as a panel, we really look forward to some demanding questions from you, uh, not least because I know that the, uh, that Tim's got some demanding questions, uh, and, and I'm an operator, and most of his uh, questions are very technical in nature, so I'm fearing those slightly. Um, it's a real privilege to be sitting amongst such an august panel, uh, some real experience either side of me here, uh, some incredible knowledge. Uh, and I feel that it's really important that we're discussing interoperability now for two reasons. The first is, whether, like myself and General Andrea, you've probably got a bias towards Euro-Atlantic security, uh, or like General Steve, there's a concern with uh, Indo-Pacific uh, security, like Mr. Mason with global security, and of course, Chris uh, equally poised to look either uh, east or west from Canada. Whichever way you look, in 2022, 2023, and 2024, it's increasingly obvious uh, that state-on-state -state threat is profound, is present, is mature, and is manifesting itself. And we clearly in Europe are seeing that with Ukraine, and clearly it's also manifesting itself in the Pacific. And if we think that either deterring, or indeed, if necessary, fighting those two adversaries is going to be an individual nation's activity, then we are sorely mistaken. And I know you get that as an audience, and we get that as a panel. But it's really important right now, isn't it, to be talking about interoperability and how we're going to work together. That's point number one. Point number two, it feels to me, like an operator, not a technical guy, that we are at a point of, uh, of capability history where we are moving into some really new and interesting spaces, whether that's through uncrewed systems, uh, through artificial intelligence, uh, all of these areas, you know, going all the way up into sort of the, the uh, almost improbable future of quantum computing that actually may be a lot closer than that we think it is. And so, as we enter these brave new worlds, it feels to me, again, really important that we do so as a community of army aviators, of aviators delivering, delivering effects in the land environments, even if that's from other components and other domains, because it's a really new and exciting world, and we're going to learn an awful lot from each other as we go through. So a real pleasure to be here and to discuss this important topic. Tim, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hey, thanks very much to Tim and to Kwade for hosting us today. Just a pleasure to be here today. The outlier wearing blue up here must be very confusing for this audience of Army aviators. Uh, so in Canada, all of our tactical aviation is vested within the RCAF. So we, we conduct um, all of the tactical aviation effects for both our Army and our SOF. My job in the Air Force is to set requirements. I run the requirement shop uh, for air and space requirements, air crew training, uh, amongst a number of other things, including our digital enterprise. Uh, so why am I here? Because um, Canada has added a bit of an inflection point. I mean, if you look, just to maybe to pick up off of Mark's comments, um, you know, you have the, the top hat of North America, super friendly country. You know, it's gigantic, 40 million people. Um, we are a relatively small military of about 100,000. Uh, and our challenge is we are pulled in three, three directions. Primarily north-south for continental security, continental defense under the NORAD agreement for airspace uh, warning control and maritime warning to make sure we can defend the continent credibly as a, as a partner. Uh, in second place would be the NATO commitment, obviously pulling us to the Euro-Atlantic. Uh, historically, obviously we have done a lot of that. World War I and World War II, Canada was a, a large player in both of those conflicts. And so we have very um, uh, significant ties and Article Five responsibilities to our European partners that, that cannot be undersold. And then more recently, I think, is a realization that we are going to be pulled to the Pacific. And so a very, for a very small military, it's very important, I think, to make sure that you are interoperable by design just released a, a new RCF strategy recently, and you will see words in there that you would not have seen from Canada for quite some time. You will see the words lethality, you'll see interoperability, you'll see operational overmatch, and the need to fight and win in future conflicts with our allies and partners. And to be able to plug in as a small military and be able to deliver a disproportionately large effect. So I, I do think there's a lot uh, of opportunity for uh, venues like this. Um, certainly we have an eye on uh, future vertical lift and on the next generation of aircraft. As you look at uh, our fleets, which are really mostly Chinook-based and Bell 412-based, dispersed widely across our country that have uh, responsibilities both internationally uh, and, and nationally uh, from a disaster relief assistance point of view. So we have a lot to talk about, and I certainly have uh, some strong opinions that I'd love to share with you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Tim. Back to you. 
Thank you very much. Okay, I think everyone would agree, uh, outstanding panel for this afternoon and for the purpose of uh, what we're all here for. Uh, I'm gonna tee up some questions here. Uh, while you think of those, if you didn't have any when you arrived, if you got questions, just bear with me a moment. Uh, I do have one I wanna start us off with. For those that know me, I'm actually going to quote doctrine and you'll know that I had to find it because I don't usually read doctrine, okay? People look at me and they say, you actually, actually know 3O? I said, well, I don't know it, but I Googled this part and looked it up. So, has it has everything to do with what we're saying here today, interoperability, and specifically, paragraph four, dash 18. Interoperability with an uni any unified action partner is essential to effective operations. Interoperability, standards, and procedures must be trained, tested, and refined during competition. It is too late to seek interoperability once a crisis or armed conflict begins. And I think we can see how it is playing out in the world stage right now. Nothing could be truer stated. So my question is this, gentlemen. Interoperability of the joint and combined team is critical to our collective ability to fight and win. Could you each please comment from your perspective on efforts to share and refine interoperability standards between the U.S. and your aviation forces. And Mr. Uh, uh, Mason, I would like some policy perspectives uh, from, from your perspective. Thank you. Sure. So as, as we look at interoperability standards, and as I say, we look at it as from a headquarters department of the Army uh, perspective, um, it, it, the, I'm going to break it down into three different buckets that we look at and execute. The first one is the standards bodies that we have. The example that I will give you right now is ASCA, which is the Artillery Security Cooperation Activities. And so ASCA as nations that come together and then work through the standard protocols and interfaces that are necessary so that for artillery, for targeting, and then artillery, we are interoperable. We are interoperable. And so through those standards bodies, uh, we've been able to expand that out into other areas as well that then facilitate not just within NATO but with the cross into Indo-PACOM the ability to execute during those events. And I, I will look at that as that's really the first is the standards bodies that we have that are out there today. The second piece that we use to try to achieve interoperability is really through our armaments cooperation efforts that we have. In those armaments cooperation efforts, and many of those are rooted underneath the NATO Army Armaments Group, the NOG as it's called, and as we come together between the aviation components that are really part of land forces, as we look at the artillery components, all of the domains that are within that Army armament side of the house, those standards bodies provide a robust capability for us to ensure interoperability. Now those bodies through COVID tended to wane. And so what we've seen right now is a significant increase in the activity that we have within those to really move forward and obviously driven by the incredibly complex security environment that we presently face. And so through the things that are out there now, the work that is done through the NAG or the NOG, and then also through the Armaments Cooperation piece that we do. And in that, I'll, I'll kind of close with that and those are our senior cooperation forum armaments that are largely based around the research development MOUs, memorandums of understanding that we have with each of these nations. And so as we meet in these forums and we look at future technology and future requirements, how can we collaborate in the development of those that then leads to interoperability in the future? So beyond the standards, boards that set things, it is really how are we collaborating, mutually investing to do co-development that would then lead into co-production opportunities and then sustainment opportunities that can reduce the logistics tail that we have and have interoperability, if you will, in the way that we can sustain systems, sustain combat formations uh, as they are out operating in austere environments. Excellent. Thank you. George Stasio. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Italian Army Aviation effort uh, uh, for interoperability starts uh, since the beginning of uh, our career. Uh, some time ago we decided to send our uh, young uh, officer uh, students aviators to, to Novosel to, to train for the basic train. 
uh, it's uh, not only a way uh, to deal uh, with the basic training for us uh, is uh, a way to, to know US uh, world, Army Aviation world, and to share with the US Army Aviation world that I said to you it's a, our, it's a reference for us, uh, our experience, a mutual understanding uh, of uh, your, uh, your system, US system. And uh, I mean uh, jargon, uh, I mean uh, culture, uh, in, uh, uh, in few words, uh, we want to, to understand the way that the US Army does think, of course, uh, to translate your experience in our little uh, reality. But this can be a good solution to, to increase uh, our interability, not only with the US Army, but uh, with the, our allies, our, our friends, uh, before possible. Uh, maybe, as I said before, for native speakers, uh, uh, the compression uh, of English is taking uh, for, uh, for granted. But for us, it is uh, it's, uh, very, very difficult. If uh, I cannot uh, speak English, I cannot operate, uh, let alone uh, to interoperate. So, uh, also my presence here uh, uh, epitomize uh, our uh, uh, desire to be fully interoperable uh, with uh, everyone uh, of, uh, of you. For jogging, uh, I send uh, my, my son to study in USA. He's attending uh, the high school uh, in Denver. He's a senior, and uh, he can fill my gap uh, in uh, speaking perfect uh, English. So interoperable is very, very important. And uh, uh, to give you some example concerning uh, uh, our, the Italian Army Aviation effort to, re to achieve interoperability, we have a lot of uh, uh, common drills exercise uh, with the US forces uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, last January, uh, with the, also the Air Force station in Europe. Uh, last week, uh, we sent the ER delegation to, to work with the your 160 Special Forces Regiment. When I created uh, uh, 10 years ago the Special Forces Army Aviation Regiment, uh, I work a lot with the Phil, the, the current commander, and he helped me to create a very a fantastic reality, Special Forces Maniacal Regiment in, in Italy. So uh, the, the effort must be common together uh, to achieve the best interoperability. Last year, Italy joined the, the Edge 22. I was personally present there and uh, where I, I said before I met uh, uh, Chris and uh, uh, today, in, in these days, another Italian delegation is following uh, the Edge 2023 because uh, uh, Edge 2022 and 23 today is, uh, is uh, very important to increase our capability it's a very important occasion to know emerging uh, technology and uh, the, the future uh, vertical lift uh, aircraft. So, uh, uh, interoperability means uh, networking, and uh, this uh, the CUDA is a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, uh, place uh, to create this uh, networking uh, among uh, 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 allies and uh, and uh, and friends. So, uh, this is our vision. This is the Italian Army Aviation Vision. Of course, we are a little reality compared to US, but we want to be an excellence. No? Also, Ferrari is a little reality, but we would like to, to be a little Ferrari. Of course, we don't have any capability, but in, in some capability, we want to achieve the same level of US Army and the same level of our allies. Of course, nevertheless, situation evolving, uh, people change, uh, uh, the, the technology go fast, so we must continue to operate in this field to guarantee uh, a perfect interoperability. Thank you. Thank sure, you. Thank you very much. General Jobs. No, thank you. That, and in fact, my answer to the question of uh, sharing and refining interoperability standards really starts uh, in the same place um, as General D'Astasio 
where he gave the example of uh, young air crew from Italy coming to Fort Novosel to train. It's about people. It's about putting our people together under a range of circumstances to be committed uh, together to sharing uh, and to being at our best collectively. Uh, I'm personally the uh, beneficiary of four years uh, of service here in the United States, two years as a liaison officer at Fort Novosel, uh, and two years with the 2nd 82nd Air Assault Battalion of the 82nd Airborne Division. That's uh, four years of developing enormous uh, friendships that have lasted, uh, well, that will last uh, throughout my lifetime, and the accumulation uh, of trust and of a commitment, a commitment to each other uh, through that time uh, together. Uh, we are very, uh, in the Australian uh, Defence Force, uh, very committed to uh, our breadth of rich and deep uh, collaboration, of sharing uh, under as many circumstances as we can possibly achieve. We have a large network uh, of exchange officers serving uh, in units uh, right across the United States Army. Uh, we have uh, liaison right across the United States uh, Army. Uh, we are flying routinely and operating routinely uh, inside each other's organisations in uh, training and in operational scenarios in Kosovo and Bosnia and Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and elsewhere. We're experimenting together. We've talked about uh, EDGE uh, and that's a, that's a, a deep and shared commitment. Uh, we're exercising together and this year we will see 30,000 men and women uh, of uh, Australia, United States, uh, other armed forces such as uh, the British will be there uh, with us and partners uh, from the region, New Zealand uh, and others coming together in uh, exercise Talisman Sabre in northeast uh, Queensland, at sea, in the air uh, and on land and across the full breadth of, uh, of the joint force. And of course we, we have uh, been operating in combat together in South Vietnam and as I've already indicated in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and, and that certainly builds that and continues uh, to progress that deep uh, commitment uh, towards each other. Look, finally, um, I, I would say that uh, as we are developing the requirements and that we are fielding our major systems, our aircraft systems uh, and those enabling systems behind those, that uh, it's vitally important that we are collaborating together as allies so that uh, we are progressing those with not just the interoperability that we will ultimately require together once they're fielded, but that interchangeability that we will need increasingly uh, as we go forward in the complex battle space. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Mark. Uh, some really great answers so far. Um, and well done, Tim, for quoting doctrine, and, and, it, and it's really good doctrine. And yeah. the most important bit in there is that you can't create interoperability at the line of departure, that it starts a long time before. Um, in the UK, we think about interoperability in, in three ways. There's human interoperability, technical interoperability, and procedural interoperability. And I think in terms of technical and procedural, in aviation, as a global community, we have, we have a real opportunity in there. We talk a common language, we share common challenges, uh, and, and sometimes, uh, we even have common platforms. And clearly, for some of us on the panel, AH-64 Echo you know, gives a fantastic interoperability opportunity with the US Army, uh, CH-47 operators, uh, those who are operating MH-47 Golfs or 47 ERs, we will call it. So lots of opportunity in there as well. And of course, that's attending to technical, and it's attending to a degree to procedural. The human interoperability is really important, and you've heard some great examples of where that's been born of recent conflicts, of exchange officers, liaison officers, and so on, um, and exercising. So, so I don't think you can ever exercise too much, and you can certainly never exercise with your allies too much, and you can certainly never <clears throat> be as open as you can be to allies coming in and exercising with you. 
it's often challenging, but it's always worth it. So I think that's a really important thing. And the question was about interoperability, I think, Tim, in part with US ground forces. Yes. There is a danger, isn't there? Oh, those of us that live in the aviation world of being slightly um, myopic. Uh, and so how well do we work with those ground forces? We have in the British Army, in my brigade combat team, as we call it in the UK Army, recently worked on divisional level exercises in Germany with a US armored BCT. And I've just come from uh, Fort Cabassos, Fort Hood, uh, from a warfighter where we were a UK division working inside a US Corps. That's really important to really tease out some of these things. Otherwise, it's fine words and doctrine. It needs to be tested. I really love the example, Tim, of logistics. I would expect that to come from you, and I'm glad that you raised it. You know, opportunity in there. Really important to work out how we can refuel, rearm our aircraft. Can we move blood su supplies around? And that sort of thing is really important. Um, so, so it's all been very positive so far. And those who remember me from last year, I always like to bring a little bit of gritty reality to it. So what could we do better? So I think comms, communications, in the technical sense, um, because you will find that a lot of our tactical communications are very uh, sovereign specific, and the point where that starts to get stitched together is really, really important. As Again, we have these amazing platforms, and not just rotary, but now fixed wing platforms that can hoover up huge amounts of information. How do we turn that into actionable intelligence? How do we then push that around the battlefield at the speed of relevance for decision making so we get inside the enemy's decision making cycle and have a kinetic or non-kinetic effect. So that's an area where we always seem to come across some of those boundaries of interoperability between nations. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Mark. That was, that was awesome. Uh, um, from my side, it, I mean, there's a, there's a massive people aspect that I'll touch on at the end, but I'll start with requirements alignment. So Canada has, is a difficult customer for an OEM. So if there's OEMs in the room that have dealt with us before, we don't have a single minister for procurement. Uh, so you have three different ministries that have to align and agree on things. And historically, uh, you know, the Armed Forces was concerned with lethality, operational overmatch. I've got a department that is concerned with uh, fairness, and I've got a department that is concerned with economic benefit for Canada. And not three of those things can be true at the same time. And so historically, you would have a losing end of that equation, which would be typically the requirement side on, in terms of lethality and operability. I think as we've watched what has occurred over the past year and a half uh, with our, our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, the poignancy of being day zero interoperable, but interoperable uh, has hit our decision makers in a way that I, I had not seen. So I think requirements alignment at the outset, um, as we develop the requirements for any new platforms or weapon systems, we need to align ourselves inside at very least some of the clubs that we all sit in, i.e. NATO or Can US or Five Eye, whatever club. Uh, that is being uh, played out as the most likely um, governing body for the next fight, I think it's important to align requirements. Canada loves to do this thing called conceive, design, build, manage. Uh, quite honestly, it needs to shift to copy by field. And I, I think you will see that more often now in our acquisitions. As you look at the F-35 decision that Canada just went through, uh, brutally long, like 12 years of, of, of uh, tur turning ourselves in knots, and we, we just recently concluded a contract with Lockheed Martin for 88 F-35s. And I know that this crowd doesn't care about fighters, but you can buy interoperability. You can actually acquire it if you, if you pick the right weapon system and platform. And I think that's an important thing to start with. Um, the second would be to train hard uh, and seek friction. To Mark's point, which I think was well articulated, we need to get together in the field and try these things out. Comms is typically the first thing that fails. It has certainly been my experience in all my, uh, my time flying Chinooks and, and for soft aviation. Um, the third thing would be uh, to bring value as a, as a small partner. Uh, bring value that is sought out by, by the allies. As an example in Canada, we're very good at Arctic operations. We understand how to live and fight uh, in the Arctic in a contested, degraded environment. Degraded meaning super cold and all of your equipment freezes. And so this is one of those things where, you know, we have the commander of our cab here in the, uh, in the audience. He has sought out a partnership in Alaska with U.S. Army Alaska and continues to train and fight with them in the middle of, of February. Um, and that is something that Canada can bring to the fight, and it's something we try and seek out now, because there is some cross-mentoring that can occur with respect to, um, you know, understanding how to operate in some of these very difficult environments. And the last, I think, was touched on on the people side. Exchange liaison attachment programs, either short duration or long, are, are massively useful. We set up our, our Chinook capability in the middle of Afghanistan, in the middle of combat, uh, badly needed and rapidly needed to be fielded. We bought aircraft from the U.S. Army, uh, as is, where is, from Bagram, flew them down to Kandahar. We trained our crews in Rucker. I did uh, all of my simulator, my crews did all of our simulator training in the UK, uh, our tactical simulator training. We took, we took best of our allies and fielded that. 
you know, flying your first combat mission with 60, 70 hours on the aircraft was pretty daunting. It can be done, but it was done on the back of the partnerships that we have, the day zero partnerships we had. And so I really want to stress that. I think, I think that aspect of um, the, the, the partnerships that we lived through, the 20 years of combat operations we've sustained in low intensity, that sets the stage for being interoperable day zero for major combat or large scale combat operations. So that's, that's what I would say, Tim. Excellent, Chris, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Great answers to that question. And uh, it brings me uh, to another one. But before I ask my question, do, does anyone have a question based on what they've just heard? Anyone? It's OK? OK. So here, here goes. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, go to uh, Brigadier Ockrell here. You mentioned uh, that you'd just been out at Fort Hood. And uh, we know that uh, central to interoperability and effective command and control in a large-scale combat fight uh, is a network that enables commanders to make decisions at machine speeds, leveraging the full capabilities of the combined arms team. My question for you, sir, is uh, having just been at Hood, uh, could you offer any observations and insights on training and C2 challenges posed by uh, large-scale combat operations? combined arms operations versus COIN uh, from the standpoint of combined operations and allied work. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Tim. I think it's such an important question. I'm not sure I'm going to give a very good answer because I'm not sure that we really know the extent of this challenge. So clearly we've talked about interoperability from a, uh, a technical perspective, and, and that in itself is a challenge. At what point do you take your national... Uh, need in your tactical communications and start to blend it at the operational level into something that you can share with your allies. So actually the question from, that falls out from that for me most logically is rather than trying to drive C2 interoperability down to the lowest level, choose at what level you want to be interoperable. And it may well be that that's defined by where you can be interoperable. So rather than a philosophical question, it could be a very practical question. Do we need to have fire teams able to talk to each other? Do we need to have aircraft of dissimilar types across nations being able to talk to each other? Uh, and I, you could argue that either way. I think then the point in the question about it being uh, uh, machine speed uh, sort of processing is a really important one. It comes back to what I said about uh, if we are really going to, uh, to win that missile fight, if we're going to dominate the adversary, uh, and, and break into their decision-making cycle. If we're going to act faster, um, the rate at which we collect, uh, then uh, synthesize information, because of course it's going to be coming from a number of sources uh, in, in electro-optic and the electromagnetic spectrum, and do all that uh, in a way that then can then be shared with our allies. That feels to me like a very, very demanding um, task. But it's a one that we must get right. So, as I said in my previous answer, I think if you look at tactical communications, that tends to be national, and I think that's probably right. At operational level, you can create uh, technical means that allows uh, NATO secret, for example, to talk to SIPA. But, but you're no, again, you're not going to do that on the line of departure. You need to have got the protocols right. You need to have thought about the waveforms. And most importantly, you need to have got the national permissions right. And that's often the greatest challenge. And then, actually, it all comes together quite nicely at a strategic level, doesn't it? Because uh, all of our agencies um, and non-military agencies are quite used to working to each other, particularly, as Chris said, where there is an existing alliance, either Five Eyes in particular uh, or NATO. So, so to flip it, because last time I started positively and ended on a, a little bit of gritty reality, I started with gritty reality. Here's the positive bit. Again, aviation gives us a really good opportunity here for things like Link 16, where now we have at least the bearer systems and the means to pass that information around. So I really do think in aviation terms, to compare to ground forces, it's there for us just to articulate the right requirements at the right point of our procurement cycles to generate some genuine C2 interoperability between our platforms and most importantly, our command posts, so that they are able to let that machine learning, let that artificial intelligence process this stuff quickly enough that we can have target effects uh, before the enemy has target effects on us. Excellent, excellent. Okay, I'm going to bounce it back to the U.S. here a little bit uh, on this side. Mr. Mason, could you talk uh, to how this network, uh, from a, perhaps a policy level, uh, that requirement is 
being or might be expanded to include all our international uh, allies and partners. Uh, what are the challenges and your thoughts on ways to overcome those challenges? Uh, so I think it's a, that's a good follow-up to really what, what uh, Brigadier Ackrell talked about at what echelon and then how, based on the echelon decisions that are made, you really target the needed, I'm going to say, C2 functions. And that's really part of, as we define the requirement that the Army has, as the Army CFT is defining for the network, that's the criticality of the experimentation that's going on within PC-22. And as we move forward from that, an edge in what's happening. And having a experimental, I'm going to say an experimental network or a persistent experimental network is one of the key elements associated with that. And that's something that we have to instantiate, not just build for every experimentation exercise we do and then tear back down, but something that we have to have that we can continuously use and continuously experiment on to make those determinations within the requirements. Again, determining echelon that you'll have for these C2 hubs and then how that would be distributed out and how you work through the technical means, but then also, as the, the panel really brought out, uh, the human dimension based on the training uh, and the relationships that exist. Uh, and I'll give a vignette from PC22 because when I was out there, and I was out there for really the international component that was going on, and what I discovered was because of the relationships that had been established is the U.S. Army general officers that I was with knew all of their counterparts because you had all served together. And so it created a common foundational language to discuss these issues, which was phenomenal. And it really focused it back to the problem is not technology, the problem is actually us, which is how do we actually work through the policies and statutes necessary to do that. And we each, each country has its own burden to conquer within that. But if you look at, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into the details a little bit, but if you look at the authority to operate on a network, we figured out how to go do that to support PC-22, which means we can. But in doing that, we had to break a lot of glass to get through it and still do it within the statutes and policies exist. And that's the area from where I sit where we have to move through that for critical allies and partners so that we do that not for some major exercise, but we do it as a routine course of business, day in and day out. And that's one of our significant focuses. I will tell you that that's a focus of Army senior leaders as we move forward as well. And they have made sure that we continue to, I'm going to say, aggressively attack the way that we've done business in the past. We still have to ensure security, but we also have to ensure that we have the interoperability all of the time, not just at certain times. Check, check. Thank you very much. G great answers to that uh, question. Any other questions uh, arising from the discussion? Any other points the panel would like to make on that particular question? Okay. All right. Well, here we go. I've got another one. I am quite surprised, however, that uh, where did I just? I thought I saw him. Ah, General Royer didn't didn't punk me out on my uh, my little crack about uh, doctrine because I think. Uh, You'd have to say that for interoperability, uh, I don't care at what level, what echelon, if you don't have common terms of reference, if you don't have a common language and what you're, how you're saying what you're going to do, uh, it's, interoperability becomes kind of nearly impossible. So doctrine is absolute foundation, I believe, uh, to what we're talking about. So I appreciate the panel uh, jumping on that and, and saying where it's, you know, it, it's got to be agreed upon and it's got to be used. I see a hand raising. Sorry. Please move to the mic, please. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Morris uh, with the Director of Air Requirements and Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, my question has to do with the terms interoperability and interchangeability. And I'd be curious to the panel's uh, views of how they would interpret interchangeability versus interoperability okay. and also, how they would see that in execution in terms of being interchangeable versus interoperable. John Justasso, you understand that? You want to take it, sir? Hey, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I guess the, I, I guess the, the example I, I would give uh, is, um, you know, we've, we've heard the, 
United States Secretary of the Army talk about the five functions for the United States Army and, the five, and overlaying those five functions in the Indo-Pacific. And one of those functions is theatre logistics for the joint force. Um, recently, the Australian government uh, released the Defence Strategic Review, and that review also highlighted uh, now the need uh, for us to lift uh, our theatre uh, logistics and theatre sustainment uh, capacity and capability. And so we've got a convergence there in the Indo-Pacific uh, around uh, the need uh, for us uh, to develop excellence in, in that theatre logistics capability. Uh, at present, we've got... Uh, or, or, or we've had a um, United States Navy MH60 uh, Romeo uh, aircraft into a, into a phase maintenance in an Australian, uh, Royal Australian Navy-led uh, depot uh, in New South Wales. And so uh, what that is a micro example of is the interchangeability that we will need inside of our logistics uh, to, ex to scale uh, as, a, as a macro outcome if we are truly to exercise the next level of, of interoperability, which is interchangeability. Um, and that's just the aviation example. Um, we're fortunate in, in aviation to be kind of leading this process, but that's going to extend you know, right across the full uh, extent uh, of the BOS. Uh, I hope that answers your question from a, from a, a limited Australian perspective there. If I, if I could, I'll... I'll, ex I'll expand on that just, just to give an example, and certainly this is something that we've seen uh, play out given today's security environment, is that you know, there's an interoperability that we tend to think of with command and control. You look at interchangeability and you would think that a 155 artillery round is a 155 artillery round, and the reality is it's not. So we've had standards and we've said we're interoperable, and the reality is we're not. So you may have each sovereign nation have its own artillery system, but how can we be interchangeable on ammunition, which then gives us the ability to leverage stores and stocks that we have within that sustainment model that's there. So there's overall and repair, but there's also the logistics of how do you get ammo, fuel, and other things to places and do that in an efficient and effective manner, and can we be interchangeable in that area? and then interoperable. So interchangeable in that we can use certain components or parts, even if we have different major end items that are based on the country's decision on what equipment they would like to have. And that is certainly an area that we are continuing to push forward on as well. Uh, and certainly as you, you talk to you know, the, the Army Material Command commander, right? it is logistics, 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 and how do you execute that in a con 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 contested logistics environment. There we go, I got that out. <laughs> Any thoughts on the question? Only, uh, sir. only to add something. Uh, for us, uh, this is another important uh, characteristic. Uh, and uh, integration, interoperability, interchangeability, it's uh, not only a military problem. Uh, we deal uh, with this uh, problem also uh, at the industrial political mm. level, uh, because uh, every country has its own uh, industry. Uh, some industry are very, very good, very strong, and uh, we can deal uh, with this problem and to solve this problem uh, only, only above all, at political level and inside uh, international organization, uh, the NATO, the European Union, uh, and uh, and so on. This is my opinion. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Oh, well, okay. Just give me the time hack. We're good, right? Okay, well, I've got uh, uh, one that I really, really want to get out there, so let me go with it. Uh, the ongoing, and we touched on some of the pieces here. Uh, the ongoing crisis in Ukraine highlights the need to be ready to fight during times of competition. One might observe that one thing that hasn't really changed, even with the high-tech weapons systems, robots, ground and air, pervasive information systems on this modern battlefield, is the criticality of logistics and sustainment. Uh, my question to the panel, what observations can you take away, if not lessons learned at this stage, uh, regarding survivable sustainment in contested logistics in uh, large-scale combat operations, uh, and what are your countries or your services uh, doing to improve survivability of that logistics? Uh, 
start with the first person that would like to jump on that grenade. I'll, I'll jump on that uh, okay. box of grenades. Um, so yes, I mean, th there are an awful lot of lessons that we can learn from, from the conflicts in Ukraine, and we need to be very careful that we learn the right lessons. It is clearly, in both the tactical and the strategic sense, stressing the sustainability of, of both warring parties. Um, I think in the tactical sense, it's a really useful reminder to all of us, uh, all of us in the audience, whether you're an operator, whether you're industry, whether you're a, a civilian employer of your government, uh, that that which looks neat on paper rarely is in reality, uh, that the battlefield is non-linear, uh, and that you'll be contested from, from literally factory to foxhole. So, so how truly resilient are we? Uh, and, uh, and I won't insult the audience's intelligence by talking about whether that means you disperse your ammunition stockpiles uh, in the forward logistic areas, how you conduct uh, refueling. Do you still have big pillow tanks fuel of thousands and thousands of liters of fuel that would clearly be very vulnerable to the first quadcopter with a grenade that would go over it? Um, I think all all uh, observers uh, uh, and uh, indeed warring parties in Ukraine are learning lessons and are learning quickly and it's interesting to see that uh, and very useful for us. I think maybe the more demanding question to answer is about strategic resilience when it comes to sustainment and logistics and the depths of our magazines, uh, the risks that have been taken over years of campaigning where activity is largely predictable, where output can be probably measured and metricized in a way. Um, and suddenly when you get to the scale of consumption that we're seeing in state-on-state -state armored warfare in Eastern Europe right now, all those calculations go out of the window. Mm. When that conflict then has a global tone to it, um, and the same primes are being asked to provide for a number of, uh, of countries, uh, the stresses then placed on industry become even more profound. I don't have any easy answers to that, but I think those are maybe the greater lessons we should be taking from a campaign that is now going on for a considerable amount of time. Now that we are in an attritional battle in Ukraine, not positional, but attritional, uh, you know, the, the echoes of just over 100 years ago are coming back, aren't they? Thank you, Mark. Excellent points. I mean, the, the, the rate of expenditure is just, I don't think anyone really imagined it. Uh, fantastic points. Anyone else on this? Yeah, sir. So, I, you, you know, as we talk and look strategically and you look at the defense industrial base of each of our countries, they are all challenged from a responsiveness and resiliency. Much of that is based on the fact that as we looked in the past, we would optimize for cost and efficiency as we looked at achieving certain price points. And we obviously accepted risk in certain areas, magazine depth being one of those that we went forward with. However, when you look at the complexity of the security environment we operate in now, the need to be prepared for large-scale combat operations, the discussion is really about how do we collaborate from a defense industrial base perspective so that we have capability to support our interoperable forces, whether it's in Europe, it's in Indo-PACOM. And so that's a fundamental shift because there is a desire, obviously, for each nation and your defense industrial base to support your armed forces, but then there is a compelling need now that we collaborate on how we do that. And that doesn't mean U.S. only or U.K. only, it's how do we all collaborate and look at where we have specific areas where we have um, risk and then how we can do that from a de defense industrial base perspective. And that is certainly the discussions that go on within um, the areas that I work in and how we are trying to move this forward really underneath OSD and our industrial base policy office that looks at this collaborative space. And certainly Army Aviation, one of the most challenging ones simply because of the technology, the complexity of it, is how do we do that and do that effectively and efficiently across uh, across our, our borders, if you will, where we both have a lot of restrictions that sometimes don't facilitate the type of interaction that we really need to support the future of operations. Thank you. Great point. Sir? Yes. Uh, according to Italy, sustainment during large-scale combat operation is uh, 
an art task is uh, one of the biggest challenge for uh, for our armies and uh, uh, but this is can consider the straight uh, forward after 20 years of uh, peace support operation or counter insurgency operation in Iraq Afghanistan and uh, in Lebanon we are not accustomed to operate and to support our uh, our forces uh, during a large scale combat operation in war uh, in war situation uh, we are trying to fix uh, to fix uh, this uh, issue and uh, strengthening our capability to fight uh, without uh, concentrating uh, our aircraft uh, and implementing a field system uh, uh, for refuel rearming and fixes minor maintenance problem on the battlefield we but uh, we are maybe a different approach. We want uh, to be autonomous on the ground, a tactical level from uh, our industry. Uh, we want to. We are trying uh, to. Uh, we are keeping the the bulk of the maintenance process uh, done only by military personnel in order to be to deploy it without delay in a full combat environment in autonomous uh, in autonomous way. But uh, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, we are still dealing uh, with the uh, critical issues related uh, to main maintenance uh, and the spare part and munition. So we, we have now achieved uh, a good result uh, uh, for sustainment uh, in large scale of combat operation in war situation. Thank you. Uh, John Jobson. I'd, I'd, I'd also, uh, I guess, um, want to support uh, General uh, D'Astasio's answer there with regard to the, uh, the logistics effort that is going to be required when we ramp up substantially consumption, uh, when we ramp up you know, substantially maintenance uh, requirements. Um, you know, we've, we've all, uh, for a long time, we've seen lean uh, practices come in, we've sought to you know, reduce down the size of the logistic tail so that we can push uh, combat uh, power uh, through the, I guess, through the, you know, from the tail to the tooth. Um, but what this conflict is showing us is that when that um, rate of effort and that uh, consumption increases uh, massively, you need, you need the people and the organisations in there to equip that massively enhanced uh, liability. Um, you know, routinely you, in peacetime you're operating aircraft for 130, 150, 200 hours a year uh, per airframe uh, in this kind of conflict. You know, we're going to be looking at quadrupling that. Um, so what does that mean for the organisations and the people and the trades and the skills that we need to have now ready to go so that we can, massive, so that we can rapidly mobilise that uh, experience and capacity base to be able to fulfil, fulfil that increased uh, liability. That's certainly a challenge uh, in Australia that we are looking at. And I, I'd kind of fall back on that discussion there about that interchangeability. Um, there, there is no point us coming into the fight with small pockets of maintenance or supply um, or, or, or parts of our logistics or administration that can only equip uh, their you know, uh, line of activity against one aircraft system or one unit, or one nation. So the more that we can be leveraging collectively uh, that workforce right from the very outset to give us then the time to, to build around them the expansion base, uh, then the better we'll be able to meet uh, the demands uh, right up front in a future conflict. Thank you, sir. I I think we're just about time, but Chris, you got just something real quick. I got like two quick things at the end. Okay. So one is to build in, I think, uh, excess capacity within your system to be able to absorb those shocks. We certainly felt the 155 challenge on the Ukraine donation piece and the unbelievably um, diverse nature of natures of ammunition and yes. who works with what gun, etc. cetera. So, um, but as you look at like a Canadian context, and you think about the austerity of the Arctic and how we have to uh, push forward our logistics and, and sustain ourselves forward you know, having ready-use dumped capabilities forward dispersed across uh, a large landmass, just from a continental defense point of view, has certainly been a lesson for us. Um, it enabled us to be quite successful in West Africa, which was really, really austere and yes. really difficult to sustain aviation. A high notice to move, like Redcon 3, Redcon 2. Um, it, that, that Arctic experience did help us greatly. But I will say, it is not cheap 
it costs an enormous amount of money in getting decision makers to really understand that there is good value in, in, that, in that sort of forward dumping, for lack of a better term. And then my last point would be signature management, making sure that, you know, camouflage concealment and, and making sure your signature is not, uh, is not revealed, dispersing your force, that's back, and we well, need to be trained into that. Thank you so much. Well, well gentlemen, folks, we're, we're out of time, uh, but I think you'd agree, great panel. These gentlemen uh, know what they're talking about. I don't care if it's at the uh, strategic and national levels, uh, right down to the tactical. Uh, interoperability is essential uh, for the team to fight effectively. So uh, uh, my hat's off to you, gentlemen, once again. Great job. Uh, thank you again on behalf of uh, Tim Crosby and uh, our branch chief, General McCurry. And folks, that wraps up uh, this panel. Thank you very much.